happy birthday to the MGMS. Uh, you're now 40 years old, which is <clears throat> sort of mature stage of life. And having uh, listened to the earlier talks this afternoon, uh, which were very impressive uh, and much enjoyed, uh, clearly the subject is really uh, a mature subject uh, now. Uh, it's a pity we can't be all together and to have a, a proper party. I would have looked forward to having a, a drink with, uh, uh, not with, but in memory of Frank Blaney, who <clears throat> the older ones amongst you will know was a legendary drinker and uh, uh, about whom there were many stories we could tell. Uh, I can't claim to be the mother of the MGMS, but I was part of the small group that set it up. And <clears throat> so uh, for you now who are part of the mature society, what I'm going to do is tell you a little bit <clears throat> about its birth, uh, maybe a bit about the pre-birth uh, and some of the things that have happened. Uh, <clears throat> it's through my eyes, and so uh, it's perhaps over-concentrated on the things with which I've been personally involved. Um, but I'll try, <clears throat> if possible, to give credit to the other people. Uh, so if uh, I make a start, <clears throat> a bit of pre-history, uh, <clears throat> my own history. I started doing research in 1961, and at that time, uh, chemists did not use computers, and uh, they were not thought to be, have any use whatsoever. Uh, <clears throat> the project I started in 1961, uh, my research project, was trying to explain why the dissociation energy of chlorine, splitting the two chlorine atoms, is higher than that of either fluorine or bromine. These things tend to go in a line, but chlorine is out of line. And so I had to try and explain that. And to do that, I needed to draw some potential energy curves. And there was a, uh, a method <coughs> to enable you to draw um, potential energy curves for diatomic molecules, the rydberg klein reese method. Uh, but it involved doing a lot of filthy integrals, really a real pain. And I had the lucky uh, idea, sheer luck. There was this newfangled thing called a computer, which could do integrals numerically, and you get around doing these horrible integrals. And so I got involved <clears throat> in computing, and in that way was one of the very first chemists anywhere to use a computer. The computer we had in Oxford at the time was the Franti Mercury, British-made computer made in Manchester, probably the best computer in the world at the time. Uh, its memory, it was a 32K machine. This predated punch cards. It predated uh, Fortran and those sort of languages. <laughs> you had to write in autocode, which was pretty close uh, to machine code. But anyway, in that way, <clears throat> I got into computing in the very early days. Again, as is so often the case in British science, Ferranti having had the world's best computer, in five years after that, there were no more British computers of any, any merit. And the sort of words which didn't exist in that era, computational chemistry that was never used, molecular mechanics didn't exist, molecular modeling didn't exist, <coughs> molecular graphics, none of those words existed at that time. And the history of the subject, molecules are, of course, nuclei and electrons. And the early work was mostly on the left-hand side to do with nuclei. This was <coughs> crystallographers wanted to display uh, what they had found in the structure to produce some models. Slightly later, the chemist side wanted to see where the electrons were, quantum chemistry, uh, and electron density potentials and fields and things came in. I was very much uh, on the right-hand side of that diagram. The um, crystallography, <laughs> the, it's, it's hard to give credit to any one person, but more than anyone else, I would like to credit uh, uh, Bob Langridge, uh, who was way ahead of his time producing uh, graphical um, pictures for the crystallographers. And it's worth pointing out to younger people who are listening now, <clears throat> that in those days, the people who did this weren't thought to be very smart. 
Bob didn't get a permanent academic post until way, way on in his career uh, in the United States. All his early years, he was essentially a technician and treated as a technician and not given the credit which he deserved. But he uh, started, <clears throat> and so for instance, this is one of his early images. And if you look at the date, you'll see this was produced in 1955, um, producing uh, a molecular structure as a model. Uh, and that was very, very new at the time. And <clears throat> coming slightly later, Ortep, uh, particularly for the crystallographers, where <clears throat> the, you could get stereo images, the two uh, displays you see there <clears throat> for the two eyes. And some of us can focus our eyes and see in the middle uh, that structure in three dimensions. Other people <clears throat> require a device. But that was also extremely important, the step whereby you could display structures uh, in three dimensions, essentially. Why is my... There we go. <clears throat> this is the sort of uh, picture that the crystallographers in the area uh, around 1970, they produced um, pictures of molecules with the uh, uh, software Pluto. Uh, <clears throat> later in that decade, Alvin Jones, who worked in, uh, in Sweden, produced Frodo. And Frodo <clears throat> was the standard package used by crystallographers uh, to display their structures. <clears throat> Moving now more towards the chemical side, uh, one of the early steps <clears throat> was producing so-called Connolly structures treating each atom in the molecule as a sphere of an appropriate size and getting a shape of the overall molecule. Because by this time, people were moving into thinking in the way that many of you who are much again working in this field today are, that much of what we do, and my graduate students always used to take the mickey out of me, I was always having a binding site and a protein and a little molecule fitting and those shapes. Uh, this uh, Connolly surface did cause a lot of trouble. Bob, Bob Langridge actually believed he'd invented it. Uh, I looked into this because Bob even wanted to have a court case about it and bombarded me with mountains of uh, copies of papers to prove that Connolly hadn't produced the Connolly surface. In fact, when I looked into it, uh, Fred Richards, who's no relation to me, just the same name, was probably the chap who deserved the credit. But this is moving now into slightly more biological things. Why is my thing not working? Okay, so the move into um, computational chemistry, and in particular, the big step moving this into pharmacology and biology. Um, again, uh, bragging slightly, I was one of the very first people to do that. Not because I was wise and thought, ah, oh, young man, that's the way to go. What actually happened to me in those days, I still worked on, with have an issue, uh, molecular orbital calculations on diatomic molecules. And in particular, I was the world's expert on spin orbit coupling, which no one's interested in at all. But I was a, a theoretical chemist using a computer. And so out of the blue, I got a letter uh, with a paper sent to me by Jim Black, later Sir James Black, who had discovered the uh, uh, beta blockers for ICI. And his, uh, he was a pharmacologist um, and very much started off with the idea, uh, the chemical transmitters, noradrenaline must work by going and binding in a binding site of a protein. So if you took the structure of the noradrenaline and gradually altered it, you might find a molecule that went into the site for noradrenaline and got stuck there and blocked the signal. And that's how Jim found the beta blockers and made billions for ICI. ICI then said to him, or rather Jim said he wanted to move on from uh, producing beta blockers to try to find something which would block the H2 activity of histamine in the gut. And uh, 
none of this I knew anything about at all. But Jim sent me a paper um, showing uh, some theoretical, some very crude theoretical calculations indicating that histamine, which is uh, drawn on the slide, exists in two conformers. And <clears throat> since at that time there were thought to be two activities of histamine, H1, the thing that causes hay fever uh, and your eyes to water, but more importantly, for something for which there wasn't a blocker, the H2 receptors in your gut and blocking them would cure stomach ulcers. I looked at this paper and sent it back to Jim and said, no, the paper is crap. You don't need to do any uh, theoretical calculations to see that histamine is a 1,2 disubstituted ethane. <clears throat> and so there are trans and gauche forms. You don't need to do any theory. Uh, but nonetheless, the theory could be right. Uh, so he called me to see him and explain that he'd already spent many millions and not found a single molecule to block the H2 receptor. Um, but um, what I suggested was that uh, he should make, uh, and his chemist in particular, Robin Ganellin, uh, who was a distinguished medicinal chemist, made a number of methyl substituted histamines. I calculated um, with molecular mechanics the ratio of the populations of the two forms, and then we would see whether that paralleled the ratio of activities between H1 and H2. No correlation whatsoever, so that was a complete waste of time. But one of the molecules made for that uh, uh, failed project was for, uh, for methyl histamine with the, hist with the methyl group there, and that molecule um, hit the H2 receptor, uh, but not the H1. And out of this, in the end, came uh, cimetidine, tagamet, and arenetidine, both of which contained that methyl, methyl group. <laughs> but getting involved in that part of, sort of work meant pushing me, uh, first of all, to have to learn and get more and more involved in applying modeling and theoretical calculations in the pharmaceutical world. I have to say at the time, everyone thought I was mad. Uh, I was uh, got a lot of scorn from my colleagues who all thought it was a total waste of time. But as you all know, it has become very important. <clears throat> Out of my group, I think uh, I'm right in that these were the first color molecular graphics uh, images that were produced. They were produced in my lab by uh, Valerie then Sackwild, now Valerie Romani, <clears throat> who is a main board director of the London Stock Exchange now. Uh, so learning uh, about computers is <clears throat> can be very useful. Uh, why these don't look, I'm sure, uh, to the younger people here, particularly interesting images, but they were made before you could make color images. Uh, at the time <clears throat> when this work was done in my group, uh, no, there was no color television. Your computers uh, did not have uh, color screens. And so these pictures were made by first putting up the molecular shape in red, uh, which is here in red, for, uh, photographing that, then winding back the film uh, and photographing it through a red filter, then winding back the film and putting up the electron density or whatever and photographing through a blue, blue screen. And so these were the first color graphic pictures. And I used to go to conferences at the time and receive applause because no one had ever seen a color picture uh, of a molecule before. And so that was a big step forward in the uh, molecular graphic, graphics world. And <clears throat> one of the problems uh, arising from that, when we started to produce color pictures, at the time, it was impossible uh, to publish them because the publishers charged a fortune, hundreds of pounds, a lot of money at the time, to publish a color picture. And also at that time, industry was gradually realizing that this may be, it had some real value to the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, my group was one of the few groups doing this sort of thing in the UK. And so a number of people from industry uh, was, came to work in my group, Andy Vinter did, uh, Frank Blaney did, 
um, and uh, people from pharmaceutical companies in Italy came and worked in my lab, uh, particularly at the time we were doing the colored work. And so this was, the subject was taking off and IBM uh, realized this. And Andy Morphew, who uh, was working for IBM, called a meeting uh, in Balls Park. And if there's anybody who is the father of uh, molecular graphics, uh, molecular graphics society, it is Andy Morphew. He called this meeting and the, amongst the people there, uh, Andy Vinter, uh, who at the time was with Wellcome, um, uh, Frank Blaney was with Beecham at the time, uh, Keith Pratt was a crystallographer, Peter Murray Rust um, was in particular uh, powerful on the database side, David White uh, was one of the other major academic figures in, in Glasgow, and out of that meeting grew the Molecular Graphic Society. <laughs> and as I mentioned, one of the main reasons for creating the society and indeed its journal was to be able to produce color pictures uh, at a reasonable price uh, for the uh, for the authors. This is the uh, uh, the original uh, editor was uh, Andy Morphew, <coughs> but he, having set it up, passed it on to me, and so I edited the journal for about the next ten years. One of our problems was how you spell the word modeling. Uh, in America, it's spelled with one L. In the UK, with two L's. <clears throat> I'm a Welshman from North Wales, and in North Wales, we pronounce double consonants. We say modeling and traveling. And so <clears throat> uh, the Welshman won, and we uh, were the Molecular Graphics and Modeling Society. This uh, image for the cover was done by Jane Burridge at, uh, again, at IBM, who were big. Uh, supporters of, of the game. And the hardware <coughs> started to progress very quickly. Um, first of all, <coughs> the most important machines were the Evans and Sutherland, uh, which were just wonderful. And <coughs> a lot of very important work was done on them. And they were vector graphics. It worked by pr producing a vector, which produced the color point. Then later, uh, we've got raster graphics, Vax, silicon graphics, and finally PCs. And that's when, of course, the subject really took off because everybody could do it. You didn't need a very expensive special machine. Uh, you could do it on a, on, on a PC. So things really got moving. And the, some of the people involved in that in those early days, uh, Arnie Hagler with molecular mechanics, quantum mechanics, Peter Coleman in uh, uh, UCSF and Martin Carpus in Harvard, Peter Willett uh, and me worked on uh, uh, similarity, uh, Paul Bamber and others on homology modeling, Peter Murray Rust databases, um, uh, Dick Kramer with 3D QSAR and Johnson on the synthesis. So the subject really took off with the new journal and things. And the software <laughs> initially Hydra produced by Rob, Rod Hubbard and Chemex uh, produced by Keith Davis in Oxford was the most used piece of software. And so at that time, companies started to be set up. Uh, Tripos by Garland Marshall uh, in the US, Chemical Design by uh, Keith here, uh, Biosim with Arnie Hagler, <coughs> Oxford Molecular uh, <coughs> set up by me and Tony Marchant. I'm going to make a, a slight digress digression here. Um, just to explain to the younger people the importance of complications about intellectual property. Uh, when I was first appointed as a lecturer in Oxford, the university, uh, I could do work in the lab using university equipment, university technicians, university um, chemicals. The university neither knew nor wanted to know about the intellectual property. It was all mine. And indeed, that was the case when Keith Davis set up uh, chemical design. He went to the university and they didn't want to know, so he had the whole company. Um, <clears throat> why was the university so generous about intellectual property? Well, it goes back to the end of the First World War. 
when the government was worried about feeding the population. And so they caused Oxford to set up uh, a department of agricultural engineering. And they put one of their own people, a man called um, Professor Owen, like me, a Welshman, but he must have come from South Wales because he was actually a crook. And uh, he patented a machine to get sugar out of sugar bees. Unfortunately, it didn't work unless there was someone round the back shoveling tape and lyle into it. Uh, the university licensed this machine to the, one of the big Italian food companies who discovered that it was a, uh, it was a fake. And uh, rather like the case that's going on uh, in California at the moment, the university was sued in 1923 for 750,000 pounds, which was an enormous sum of money at the time. The case went on until the late 30s. The university got away with about 75,000 pounds. But because of that, they didn't want to know anything about intellectual property. <laughs> In 1942, um, the next part of this story, again about food, Britain was in danger of starving because of our ships being sunk in the Atlantic. America had not come into the war, France had fallen. And uh, <laughs> Churchill met with Roosevelt and they set up the so-called Lend-Lease Agreement, whereby the Americans gave us 50 ships so we could bring in some food. We gave them permanent leases on bases in the West Indies, hence it was called the Lend-Lease Agreement. But also, and most people don't know this, we agreed in the Lend-Lease Agreement not to patent radar, the jet engine, and penicillin. So we gave away billions and billions for those ships, not because we were stupid. All those uh, inventions uh, had strategic importance in the war, uh, obviously radar and the jet engine. Uh, but when the troops landed on the beach at D-Day, they all had penicillin in their helmets because Flory and uh, Chain had flown over from uh, uh, the UK with the penicillin spores dusted on their clothes in case they got shot down and dusted them off in America, gave it to the Americans. And Heatley, uh, the then technician, but real star turn in that group, found a little agricultural, obscure little agricultural company uh, to uh, do the uh, um, synthesis. Uh, that company was called Pfizer. And, uh, so we gave away billions and billions and billions. So when the Attlee government came to power in 1945, they realized that we had been rather stupid about intellectual property. And so they set up the National Research for Development Corporation, the NRDC. And the NRDC owned all the intellectual property of any research done with government funding, which essentially meant virtually everything <coughs> done in universities. Um, the NRDC later changed its name to BTG. And I used to go to lectures given by them in the mid 1980s. And they would put up a slide which had profit going up the Y axis, time on the X axis from 1945 through to 1985. And it went up and up and up. And people used to clap. Here was a nationalized industry which was making a fortune. However, if you just took two patents out of the NRDC's portfolio, the cephalosporins, which came out of Oxford, and the pyrethroids, which came out of Rothamsted, this graph went down and down and down. The NRDC were bloody awful. And so, uh, for instance, they decided that the, that the hovercraft wasn't worth patenting. Silly, but not all that crucial. But also, uh, in the mid-1980s, when we had Mrs. Thatcher as prime minister, the only prime minister ever who understood anything about, about this sort of thing, the NRDC decided that monoclonal antibodies weren't worth patenting, and again, gave away billions. So Mrs. Thatcher put the skids under the NRDC, gave the um, intellectual property, which is what now obtains, 
anything you do in university with uh, backed by government funding, the intellectual property was given to the universities, providing they set up a mechanism to exploit it. And I was much involved in this and uh, uh, set up <clears throat> what is now called um, the uh, Oxford University Innovation. And the first company we set up uh, was Oxford Molecular. <laughs> and that, <clears throat> in a slightly, you may think this slightly bizarre, we had a meeting of the uh, Molecular Graphics and Modeling Society here in Oxford uh, in 1988, organized by me and Frank Blaney. And I can't remember whether I was giving a talk or being the chairman, but at the time my wife was uh, extremely uh, very ill in hospital. And I remember being very touched almost to the point of tears, but somebody, one of the members of the committee of the MGMS, uh, at the end of my talk, presented with me flowers to take to my wife. Anyway, uh, very shortly afterwards, within days, <coughs> my wife actually died. And uh, which you know, obviously is pretty um, distressing to say the least. But what I did as a result of that, um, the day after her funeral, I rang up Tony Marchington, who'd been a pupil of mine uh, and was some, a considerable entrepreneur, and uh, said to Tony, uh, and this was really done as therapy for me to keep me busy, uh, you know that company we've talked about for years, let's bloody well do it. So we set up um, uh, Oxford Molecular. We got uh, £350,000 of venture capital, quite hard to uh, <clears throat> do much with, but Tony, uh, was a, a real entrepreneur, as some of you <clears throat> will know, while he was my graduate student, he part wrote a film script about C.S. Lewis and was paid £3,000 for doing so. And uh, that was quite a lot of money for a graduate student in around about 1980. Uh, but what did he do with the money? He went out and bought a steamroller. I thought, you know, the boy has gone off his head until I discovered that he took his steamroller to steam rallies uh, over the weekends in the summer, and was paid 250 pounds in wet pound notes to take his steam engine along. And this was just at the period when companies were starting to get interested in uh, molecular graphics modeling uh, and uh, computational chemistry. And so uh, although ICI at the time, uh, it was, there was a recession, they had a no hiring policy. They hired Tony when he finished his DPhil with me. Uh, and he was the first person in ICI to do this sort of thing. Uh, and they, although they um, had a no hiring policy, they gave him the biggest starting salary they'd ever given anybody at, at that stage of their career. So what did Tony do with that? Uh, he went to the bank, borrowed 35,000 pounds and bought a pair of steam plows let he break steam engines that pull a plowshare between them and took them to steam rallies. Uh, but being Tony, he thought, well, if they're making so much money out of their steam rallies, uh, they must be doing better themselves. So age 24, six months into his first job at ICI, he organized his own steam rally and made 48,000 profit in a weekend and set up a company to run steam engines. <laughs> By the time my wife died, he left ICI and was just running a steam engine business, rather profitably. And uh, since that was a summer business and my wife died in November, uh, we could set up the company. And so Oxford Molecular, we set up in uh, 89 to do this sort of thing. We floated on the stock market in 92. We sold a third of it for 10 million, took it up to worth uh, 470 million. Uh, and at that time, <clears throat> we, unlike the usual practice, we did seven takeovers in the States. We had the world's uh, biggest share of the molecular modeling uh, uh, software. Um, and we took it up to worth 470 million, screwed it up and sold it, uh, sold it for 70 million. But by this time, um, molecular graphics modeling was becoming a real commercial venture. And the uh, people who were doing this, um, perhaps the leading light was Peter Gunt at, at Merck, who was very much ahead of other people, Tony at ICI in 1982. And by that time, <laughs> the big pharma groups 
gradually uh, got involved in this, hired people, and then smaller groups uh, started all over the place. Uh, energy calculations uh, were being done, <coughs> quantum mechanics, molecular mechanics, DFT force fields, Monte Carlo, molecular dynamics, the things which uh, I am pleased to see are still going. Uh, but now, of course, you have uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning uh, making the whole field even more exciting uh, than it used to be. Virtual, virtual reality uh, was also brought in, particularly by uh, Mike Han at GSK uh, and, and Mike Peake uh, at, uh, at UNC, and then Scripps. Um, one of the things that I did, which I think had a bit of influence in this, was to bring modeling to the masses. Uh, in 2001, I started a screensaver project. I'd actually stolen the idea um, from SETI, <laughs> the, as you may know, as we sit here on the earth, uh, all at every moment of time, from all directions, radio signals come in and hit us. And these can be recorded and you can produce a simple piece of software to see, is this signal noise or, or is, it a, is it ET sending us a signal? And some bright young guys, uh, you could of course waste an awful lot of computer time, as has been wasted on that, analyzing these signals for years and years and finding nothing. <clears throat> so the bright guys at Berkeley came up with a scheme to put the software which tests whether the signal is noise or uh, 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 an intelligent signal uh, in a, into a screensaver and then get people around the world to put it on their PCs. I stole the idea and we changed it so that you got um, uh, sent out uh, in the screensaver a very crude way of calculating the binding energy between uh, one of our database of small molecules, uh, this done <coughs> with Keith Davis's software, and uh, a database of literally billions of molecules to be sent out. <coughs> and we had uh, three and a half million people around the world who took on <coughs> the screensaver. And this is what it looked like uh, on the left. There <coughs> was the current protein target. And then whichever molecule you were uh, uh, sent out was uh, shown. And we got, uh, we sent out the things many times to avoid hackers um, uh, cheating. Uh, in a, <coughs> initially, we. Uh, uh, had prizes, um, but it wasn't necessary. It really took off. Um, and initially, all the targets were uh, cancer targets, and uh, we were backed by the US National Foundation for Cancer Research. Uh, but also, the initial cancer work was funded by Intel. And then, um, again, you will remember. Uh, <coughs> now 20 years ago, uh, when after 9-11, uh, uh, which everyone does remember, many people have forgotten that within weeks of 9-11, uh, Washington was shut down because people uh, were sent by some terrorist anthrax in an envelope. And so uh, the, the, cap the Capitol building had to be shut down, absolute chaos. So it was clear that anthrax, which is pretty easy to produce, is a very serious uh, bioweapon. <clears throat> and of course, the pharmaceutical industry aren't interested in that because and if it's not used, they'll never make any money. And so we uh, took on the anthrax project funded by IBM uh, and gave the results uh, to the uh, US Department of Defense. <clears throat> and then later did a similar problem uh, project uh, on smallpox. And as I said, we had three and a half million people around the world uh, working on this. Uh, it's no longer necessary. Uh, we had, uh, for that project, I had more computer power than all the world's major pharmaceutical companies put together for that sort of calculation. Um, and uh, it got a, a lot of interest. And one reason we uh, packed it up uh, was that uh, cloud computing came along so you can get lots of time without needing. Uh, and it's Garrett who's helping me here. 
uh, who uh, introduced that uh, to my research group. Uh, but also another reason um, we gave up the screensaver project. Uh, I was getting literally thousands of emails from people all over the world saying, my mother has just been diagnosed by, with breast cancer, and I think taking part in this project is so important. The sort of letters, uh, emails to which you felt you had to send a reply. Um, you could manage hundreds, but not thousands. But anyway, in this way, um, molecular modeling and graphics were spread to the knowledge uh, of lots of people, even including some politicians. And so molecular graphics produced lovely, lovely pictures and uh, uh, with which you're all familiar and uh, uh, you all have your own favorites. Uh, but it is a very beautiful subject. Uh, but I, <clears throat> we must remember these are only molecules, it's not the real thing. So I'm going to leave you uh, with the wit uh, and artistic skill uh, of Mike Fan, who I believe, I, I think he's probably in the audience, and as he's not so bored with me, he's already left. Uh, but he produced this uh, lovely thought, um, uh, his version of Magritte. So once again, happy birthday, Molecular Graphic Society. The subject has grown to be international, worldwide, extremely important. And the opportunities which artificial intelligence and uh, machine learning now offer, I mean, one can not unrealistically think that the day will come when all we need is a gene sequence and we'll plug that in and get out the appropriate uh, protein structures and the molecules from an enormous, enormous database will fit those sites. It's a, the subject has had a very interesting past, which I've uh, been happy to play a part in. Uh, and I'm sure all of you will have very important and exciting futures. Thank you all.